Good evening. Good evening. Mm, we are getting so close with that. Good evening. Good evening. There you are. It's good to see you uh, this afternoon. Uh, we have an opportunity to join together for about the next hour and to study from God's Word. We have an opportunity to recharge our batteries for the week. What a great opportunity we have. I hope you've gri grabbed a bulletin that looks like this. They're on outside of all three of the doors. Uh, they'll tell you everything you need to know. I have just a couple to add to that. And uh, this evening, leading us in devotional thoughts will be Brother Michael Cox. Leading us in singing will not be Brother Xander Collier. Uh, leading us in opening prayer will be Brother Kenny Ward. And leading us in closing prayer, Brother Connor Johnson. Scott Griffin. There we go. Griffith, I'm sorry. I'll be leading us in singing. Uh, on your prayer list, add Carlissa and Savannah Ford. That is the wife and daughter of Stephen Ford, the preacher at the Highway Church of Christ. Uh, they are battling COVID right now, and they surely uh, would love to have your prayers. Uh, remember that on August the 29th, that Sunday, we're going to have an all-ages the fifth Sunday is not really a Devo as much as it is a fifth Sunday all ages hanging out and enjoying each other's company and eating snacks together and playing a bunch of games and that kind of thing. So uh, come to that. That'll be fun. Uh, that starts at 3.30 to 5.30 at the Multipurpose Building. Also keep in your prayers Miss Kay Ward's great niece Jody Rico and her son Logan. Uh, they were hit by a drunk driver uh, that caught their car on fire. And she was burned about 15%, he about 30. Uh, they're doing all right, but they're in the hospital in Denver. And also uh, a, a grandson of her niece, Lane Moore, who is three years old, was diagnosed with Wilma's tumor. And that's uh, s uh, some small tumors on his kidneys. And he has had a surgery for that. And he is recovering. But keep those that family uh, in your prayers and they will... Uh, keep laying on some pain management and some uh, chemotherapy to make sure all of those things are going well. Keep those uh, folks in your prayers. Let's go to God in prayer and we'll turn the services over. Our dearly Father, we're grateful that you look on us and, and bless us as much as you do and that you never forget about us, that you are always pouring those blessings out on us. We pray that we would be examples for your Son, uh, here as we live this side of eternity and that many people will see how we live and want to know more about becoming a child of God. We pray that we would be lights in a dark world. We pray that we would be able to be used in your kingdom uh, so that your kingdom will be able to grow. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. <clears throat> Number 175, the church's <clears throat> one foundation.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful once again to be here and in the middle of the week. Father, it is uh, good to be a part of the Lord's body. We ask, Father, that you help us to strive to stay in contact with the blood of Christ, those that are. And we ask, Father, that you help us each day to be a better example. We ask that you continue to be with the family at Highway Church of Christ, the uh, preacher there, his wife and family, and help them to uh, get through this COVID with uh, the uh, minimal amount of symptoms that they can get, they can have, and uh, others, Father, that are experiencing uh, health issues with COVID and other health issues. So many. Pray for that uh, young baby and ask for him to get the best care possible and uh, treatment. We ask that you continue to be with Kay Ward's uh, family that was in the accident that uh, resulted in uh, fire. And we just pray that they get the best proper care for these burns and and just uh, be with them and help them to overcome any extending effects of it. We ask, Father, that you continue to help us to take in the lesson that we're going to have this evening and uh, help us to make applications to our lives, help us to, to do your will and the very purpose that you have for us in our lives and increase our faith. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. It's the middle of the week. You may be tired, a little worn out. You need a, a peak, something uplifting, something uh, encouraging, something motivational. Well, I'm here to give it to you tonight. And I'm going to give it to you from the man named Job. Job chapter 9, verse 32. For he is not a man as I am, speaking about God, that I should answer him. And we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman between us that he might lay his hand upon us both. What is Job talking about right here? Job is struggling. Job in his suffering was mystified at this point by God's complete silence. Other people had come to him, his friends. They had given him advice, not very good advice, but he had heard nothing from God. And he had served God faithfully. In fact, God himself said so in, in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. So Job, he longed to come before his Lord and, and plead his case, but that was not possible. And Job understood that. Have you ever felt like Job? Have you ever thought, why do bad things keep on happening to me? What did I do wrong? Life isn't fair. <laughs> I'd like to have a sit-down meeting with God right now. Did you notice that word that we don't use today? In verse 33, a day's man. What does day's man mean? Well, as I said, we don't use that word today. We would use probably one of two words in place of that word. We would use the word mediator. Or we could use the word advocate. Job is saying, I don't have someone to be a mediator between me and God. I don't have someone that will plead my case and, and be my advocate to God. Well, here is your peak. Here is what's uplifting. Here is what's encouraging. You and I, we have it. We have that mediator. We have that advocate. It says, there is only one perfect mediator. Who is that? The Son of Man, Jesus, yes, God, 
the Son. He is our mediator. He is our advocate. 1 Timothy chapter 2, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom. For who? For all of us. To be testified in due time. Jesus is our mediator. He's pleading our case. He's going to bat for us, to borrow a baseball term. 1 John chapter 2. My little children, John here copies a phrase that Jesus used in that last teaching speech that he gave to his apostles. He called them his little children. Here John says, my little children, these things are right to you, so that you may not sin. If, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Isn't it wonderful to know that we're not like Job? Job was scratching his head saying, what do I do? You know, God is way up there. I can't be on his level and I'm way down here and there's no one in between us. We have that special mediator there for us. But he's only a mediator. He's only an advocate for those who have obeyed. What did Jesus say in John 14? He said, if you love me, you will do what? You will keep my commandments. Have we done that? Have we put on our Lord in baptism? Once again, you see these verses. Every time I get up here, those are words of Jesus, not my words. Have you become a New Testament Christian? If you are a New Testament Christian, do you need to seek forgiveness? Isn't it wonderful that God will forgive? The church here is ready to pray with you and for you. If you have any need at all to respond, please do so as we stand and sing for your encouragement. I am Let us pray. Our God, our Father, we are humbled to come before you this evening to bow before the throne of the great I Am, the true, the one living God. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to come tonight to lift each other up, to be together, to encourage one another, 
in the middle of the week. We are also thankful to be here to learn more about your word, to grow closer to you, to be able to share your truth with others around us. Dear God, there are several that have been mentioned this evening that are in need of prayers. We ask that you be with each and every one of those families in those situations, dear God. We asked for full recoveries for all of them, but more importantly, we also ask that your will be done. That in each one of those situations, someone who doesn't know you may come to learn more about you, to learn about your truth, and then may come to be an obedient child of yours. As we go to our classes, dear God, help us to be attentive, to have an eager, an eager desire, to have a, a fire that burns in us that can't be closed up to learn about your word, to learn more about who you want us to be. We ask you to be with us as we go to our class. We ask you to forgive us our sins. We ask all these things through your son's name. Amen. If you need any of our outlines, if you need any of our outlines, they're up here on the communion table. We're up to story number 153. I know we've been camped out here for a while. Uh, it covers a lot of information. Uh, you may have noticed on the back side of story 153, there's a lot of lines there. Uh, that's there for you to write in some of this information. Uh, we're looking at... Jesus' last teaching moment with his apostles. In a few hours, he will be arrested. They will scatter. So this is Jesus' last second opportunity for him to leave a message with those men. Let's go ahead and... and um, there we go. Welcome to our class. We are glad that you're here. We're glad that also those who are watching. Appreciate that so very much. Before we get into the class, let me mention once again uh, something that we started last Thursday on Fundamentals of the Faith, which airs Monday through Saturday at 7 a.m. We are looking at the identification marks of the church. How does one know when they go to a new city? How do you know how to find the New Testament church? Uh, Billy Sunday mentioned an old song that uh, we used to sing quite often. The song was called, You Never Mention Him to Me. In that song it says, you know, you never mentioned him to me. We saw each other day by day and you knew I was astray, but you never mentioned him to me. I want to invite you to do what I'm doing. Ten. Ten at a time. What I've done is I have made a list. Right now my list has 149 names on it. And I'm doing it ten at a time. And I'm calling those ten people up. And I'm inviting them. I'm encouraging them. I'm actually pleading with them to tune in to this series of studies. The series of studies will take about four weeks. I don't want anybody to say, you never mentioned him to me. Let me invite you to do the same thing. Uh, these studies are presented in a very loving way, but it's the truth. I'm presenting the truth. How do you identify the church? You know, what kind of worship does the church have? How do you become a member of the church? Uh, you know, all the things that makes up God's church. And I'm going through it 10 minutes at a time. Uh, 
I'm telling people, all you got to do is watch it for 10 minutes. You know, it'll never go above 10 minutes. I always watch the clock, and when I get close to 10 minutes, I cut it off. Do this and give them an opportunity to hear the truth. Talk about the people that you know that are not Christians. Because you don't want them to say to you, you never mentioned him to me. So please do that for me. I would appreciate that so very much. Now, we're in story number 153 on the back side there. We're in John 14, 15, and 16. Now, tonight I want to remind you, if you have a question or comment, please text it to me. I would appreciate that. That way I can get it on the Facebook feed. Tonight it's double important to do that because I love questions. I love questions. Uh, but often we have some people come up after the class is over and ask me some uh, individual questions, which I don't mind because I love questions. But tonight I can't stay. I've got another obligation. So I've got to leave as soon as class is over. So tonight I, I can't stay. Uh, so hold your question. If you've got an individual question that you want to ask me individually, uh, I guess wait until Sunday's class, okay? Now, story number 153. We're talking about that farewell speech, that farewell discourse to the disciples, John 14 through 16. This is happening maybe as early as 9 p.m. on what we would call Thursday night. They would call it a new day. Their new day started at sunset. Or it could be as late as 11 p.m. We're not really for sure on the time. We're up to John 14, verse 15. John 14, verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. The best barometer of our love for God is what? Our love for His children. Our love for His children. Let's continue. And I will pray, and I'll give you another help. Did you catch that? Another helper? Who was the first helper? Well, Jesus. Jesus was their first helper. Now they're going to receive God the Spirit as their other helper, that He may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. For He dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Remember how this chapter started? Let not your hearts be troubled. Three times it says that Jesus was troubled. This is going to be a tough time for Him. The trial, the crucifixion. It's not going to be pleasant. He's troubled, but he doesn't want his apostles troubled. He is taking care of them. Remember what he does at the arrest? Hey, you came to arrest me, let these others go. He's protecting, he's protecting his apostles. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am, I am in my Father. And you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Those who love Jesus, those who whose love for Jesus is validated by their obedience. Remember, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Those whose love for Jesus is validated by their obedience are, are granted a most precious gift, the Holy Spirit. I've got a question for you. Why don't we talk more about the Holy Spirit? Think about it. How many classes have you 
been through on the Holy Spirit? How many sermons have you been through that dealt with the Holy Spirit? Uh, Holy Spirit, we often don't talk about His role and His function. Why? Here's my opinion. We have allowed the charismatic movement to take that part of Christianity away from us. You know, they talk about it. You know, we call them the, you know, those uh, holy rollers. And, and they're always, you know, talk about those things. And they say they've got miraculous gifts and they got this and they got that. Well, we know the truth. That's not the truth. So what do we do? We often back away from it. We back away and don't talk about it. Guess what? We're going to talk about it. Now, I've already, I'm, in fact, on Sunday, I'm going to announce the next class that I'm preparing to teach. And I'm excited about it. It's not the Holy Spirit. But I am starting to work. Either it's going to be a sermon series or a class series on the role and function of the Holy Spirit. So get ready for that. That's coming down the road. We don't know when, but coming down the road. And it's something we need to talk about. Because the Holy Spirit is part of our lives. Let's continue on. Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you. Well, I am going to leave you, but I'm not really leaving you. Did you catch that? He will leave them, but he's not really leaving them. Because the loss will be replaced by the Holy Spirit. What a great comfort to know that God the Spirit is going to come and guide them and help them and comfort them. In fact, the next book that we have in our Bible is the book of Acts. If you look at chapter 1, it says what? Acts of the Apostles. Really, it's Acts of the Holy Spirit done through the apostles, okay? That's really the true meaning of that book. Let's look at verse 22. The other Judas speaks up. Judas, not Iscariot. Uh, John uses his name Judas. His other name that we know him by is probably Thaddeus. He said, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Uh, Jesus, uh, uh, if you're going to have a physical kingdom, you can't hide, okay? You know, if you're going to have a physical kingdom, Jesus, you're going to have to let people see you. So Judas is still thinking here, Thaddeus, is still thinking about a physical kingdom, not a spiritual kingdom. Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Jesus brings him back to what's really important. To answer his question, let's go back to what's really important. If anybody loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the words which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. These things I've spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, forget about physical kingdom, Thaddeus. Let's talk about spiritual matters. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Lord will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace. Shalom. Peace. I live with, I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. And then it goes back to verse one again, verse one again. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus said, Thaddeus, let's get back to what's really important here. It's spiritual, not physical. Take your eyes off of the physical, put your eyes and heart on the spiritual here, Thaddeus. The Holy Spirit, what does He do? 
He will give the apostles divine recall. Divine recall. Go with me over to uh, back to uh, chapter. Let's go to chapter sixteen, verse thirteen. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you in all truth. So He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. In some ways, the second helper, remember Jesus is the first helper? You know, Jesus said, I'm going to send you another helper. In some ways, the second helper makes everything clear. You know, Jesus, the first helper, he often had to speak in parables and in symbolism and, and to get his message out without uh, upsetting the timeline. The Spirit doesn't have that problem. He teaches, he leads clearly. He gives the apostles divine recall. Do you remember what you said last week? Well, no, you probably don't. You can't repeat it. You don't remember. You know, none of us have that, that kind of recall. Here, these men who wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the rest of the books, the, the Holy Spirit gave them divine recall where they could remember what Jesus said, even though it had been several years prior. The Holy Spirit will interpret and apply he will interpret and apply for them. The Holy Spirit will guide their writings. Then as I say, in verse 27, Jesus goes back to verse 1. What's this speech for? It's to give them comfort in a troubled time. How do I describe the apostles on that Saturday? I once did a lesson, I called it, the frightened few of Friday, because they were frightened, they ran. The sad sons of Saturday, they're sad. You know, they were banking on Jesus and now he's dead. And then I call Sunday the sun, S-O-N, the sun, S-O-N, rise of Sunday. And their whole outlook changed. So these men are troubled. What do we do? How do we handle this? Verse 28, again, Jesus describes his what? His intimate exodus and his return. Now, Satan is going to get a triumph here. Yeah, he's going to win over Judas. In fact, Judas has already plotted and he's already got Judas. He'll get the other nine because they run. Peter follows at a distance, but he denies his Lord. And Satan also gets a momentary physical victory over Jesus. But see, Satan had really no power. I remember many years ago, this is, I don't know, probably 20 years ago, I went to a, a, a dramatic play at Branson called The Promise. Some of you may have seen that. And it's supposed to be the life of Jesus. And I remember the, the actor who played the part of Satan. And at this point, with the trial, with the arrest coming up and the trial, boy, he's just jumping for joy. He's gleeful. He's excited, you know. But on that first day of the week, he runs away because he knows he has been defeated. Now, while the apostles prepare to leave, Jesus continues to teach. Now, I want you to notice something here. Look at John 14, verse 31. Then we're going to look at John 18, verse 1. Okay, well, remember, we're in the upper room. Jesus says, verse 31 of chapter 14, "...but that the world may know that I love the Father." And as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. 
In other words, let's leave the upper room. But then turn to chapter 18. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden where, which he and his disciples entered. What is happening here? In verse 31, he says, let's go, let's leave. And in verse 1 of chapter 18, he's about to leave the area and go to the garden. What happens? Let me give you two possibilities. Because honestly, we don't know. Let's give you two possibilities. Remember, who's the host of this Passover meal? It's Jesus. And Jesus is the perfect host. Do you think they would just leave without cleaning up the mess? Putting things away? Cleaning up? And while the apostles are cleaning up, Jesus is still teaching. That's a possibility. Also, here's another possibility. In verse 1 of chapter 15... Through verse 17 of chapter 15, Jesus will talk about the vine and the branches. The vine and the branches, that was a symbol of Israel. A symbol of Israel. When the, uh, uh, when the Maccabees kicked out the Greeks during the Hasmonean time period, that's what they put on their coins. A vine. Because that's a symbol of Israel. Herod the Great, when he was remodeling Zerubbabel's temple, on the entrance way into the most holy place, on the doorway, he had goldsmiths to create this gold vine. And for a certain fee, rich families could add their families to the vine. So what would happen? That vine kept on getting bigger and bigger and bigger because rich families would have goldsmiths to add their family grapes up there on that vine. It's possible that Jesus in chapter 14, verse 31, leaves the upper room, but before he goes to the garden, may take a detour back through the temple. The temple gates only stood open at night one time a year. Just one time a year. That was during Passover. During the Passover. They had those gates open because it was a custom for people to give those alms. Remember, the disciples thought that Judas was perhaps leaving to give alms. Well, that's what people would do. They would go to the temple. Remember those 13 shofar collection trumpets? And people would go and put extra contributions in those shofar temple trumpets. And that was supposed to go for the poor people. Some people say that Jesus left the upper room and went to the temple and he's using that vine that gold vine, as a teaching illustration for what he's going to say here in chapter 15. In honesty, we don't know. We know he says, we're get, let's go and leave in chapter 14. Then it says, we're going now into the garden, chapter 18. So there is a gap there. We don't know exactly what causes the gap. Chapter 15, when we look at chapter 15... When we look at chapter 15, chapter 15 can be divided into three parts. Jesus is going to talk about unity with him. He's going to give them the picture of that vine. Because that vine, those branches depend on that vine. Now I have to uh, confess to you, my mother's mother was a character, okay? <laughs> she was a character. And my mom would always, uh, she died on my 16th birthday, and she was 96. And when we would go visit my grandma, my mother would say, don't you ever touch those bottles up there. And she would point to these bottles on top of her cabinet. 
because my grandma grew grapes. You can already guess what my grandma made, okay? Okay? So I'm well familiar with grapevines because she had a, a large amount of grapevines there at her house. They start from that vine. And those little branches that branch off, those little branches end up, they, they, they hold a massive amount of fruit. Grapes. So, first part of chapter 15, Jesus is going to talk about unity with him. The second part is unity with other believers. And then he is going to remind them we're going to face some opposition. Because our unity with Jesus is the basis of our unity with each other. And it's also the basis of the opposition that we get from the world. Look at verse 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. He's the gardener. Okay? God is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. One of the things my grandma would do with her grapevines is she would get rid of those dead parts. Because the dead parts just weigh down the vine and they end up causing the production, the amount of grapes to be decreased. So she would cut down and cut out the bad part. That does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. One of the things you have to do in the beginning of the year is prune those grape vines. I remember as a little boy having to do that for my grandmother, okay? I remember that. You have to prune them, to cut them back. You know what? Our struggles prune us. Our tribulations, our troubles make us stronger. You are already clean. And remember back in the previous chapter, or back in chapter 13, he said, one of you are not clean. That was Judas. But now speaking to the 11, he says, you are already clean. Why? Because of the word which I have spoken to you, living by my word. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch itself cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. How many grapes for those branches and parts of the vine that my grandmother cut off that were dead, how many grapes do those produce? Zero. They're dead. Okay. You have to be connected to the vine. Once we cut them off from the vine, from the main root system, they're not going to produce anything at all. We cannot produce unless we stay in Jesus. I am the vine, you are the branches. If Jesus does leave the upper room, I'm going to say if, the big word if there, and if, once again, the big word if, if he's now standing in the temple court area, I can see Jesus pointing to that gold vine and saying, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. that vine was that common symbol for Israel. As I said, it was on the gold coins. It was there on the entrance to the, the, to the holy place of Herod's temple. Grapes only grow on the new branches. We must bear fruit. That's a picture of judgment. To bear fruit, we must stay in the Word. One of my 10 people that I've already contacted, in fact, I'm now up to number 20, 29. One of my people that I invited did watch and call me back and had questions for me. 
one of his questions was, why do we have to go by the Bible? Actually, that was his question. Why do we have to go by the pattern? Because I keep on talking about the pattern. Because he said, I don't want to stay by a pattern. I, want to make, I, I don't want to be old-fashioned. That was his terminology. When we leave the pattern, we're leaving the Word. If you leave the pattern of the New Testament, you are leaving, in the, leaving the Word. We must stay in the Word. Look at verse 9 now. As a father loves me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments, and abide in his love. Have you noticed Jesus keeps on going through the same, the same subject matter? This is his last second, last possibility, his last opportunity to talk to these men before the cross. It's like that coach saying, hey, let's huddle up. The game's about to start. Let's huddle up. Remember, you know, the guy over there, the, the, the point guard, he's, he's, a, he's a great outside shooter. And then remember that guy, number 21, you know, he's, he's a tough rebounder. You've got to block him out. You know, that coach gives last-minute instructions on what's really important. Jesus is giving last-minute instruction. One of the things he talks about, he talks about love, he talks about the Holy Spirit, he talks about how to deal with opposition. The key word here is love, but it's not just any kind of love. It's sacrificial love. It's the kind of love that, that we see in Jesus himself. If we love him, we will obey him. To the gentleman that called me back, to my friend, we've been friends for a long time, I told him, let's look at John 14, 15. I said, let's read that. That's Jesus talking here. Then I said, do you love Jesus? He said, oh, Michael, you know I love Jesus. Well, what did he say? Keep my commandments. He's a grandfather like me, and I mentioned his, they have, he has two grandchildren. I mentioned their names. I said, what would you think if your grandchildren never obeyed you? Well, I wouldn't like it. I wouldn't like it if my grandchildren didn't obey me. That would show to you that they really don't love you, right? Yeah, I guess so. If you love Jesus, you will obey here he's going to talk about joy. Let's continue on. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Stop right there. Jesus, you're about to be arrested. Probably within an hour or two of this, you're going to be arrested. You're going to be mistreated. And you're talking about joy? Yeah, I'm talking about joy. Because Jesus sees the big picture. How often do we get bogged down because we see the little picture? Remember the story about the, the four blind men that discover an elephant? And one blind man is feeling around and he says, uh, uh, this elephant, uh, it feels like a, a big leaf because he's grabbing the elephant's ears. And another one says, no, no, he, it's not a big leaf, it's like a big giant snake because he's got his hands on the trunk, you know, the trunk of the elephant. And another one is getting hit by the tail. He says, oh, no, this is like a feather duster, you know, hitting me here in the head. What's happening? Each blind man was only seeing a small picture in their mind of the elephant. Is an elephant a, a giant snake or a big plant or a... Feather duster? Well, no. You know what an elephant is. The big picture, Jesus says, is joy. Joy. Remember how Mary Magdalene reacted after really realizing that she was speaking to Jesus? 
she was filled with joy. He is our true friend. Let's continue. He is our true friend. This is my commandment that you love one another as I love you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants. Remember a rabbi, a rabbi could call his teachers, he could call them servants. That was acceptable. For a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give. These things I command you, that you love one another. That you love one another. Jesus answers prayers. Now we've already talked uh, last Sunday about how that comes about. You know, what is the requirements on our part and, and what we should ask for. But Jesus right here is saying, believe, trust, know. Our little son had a favorite, remember that little favorite uh, truck he had? And the wheel had come off. And he's, I don't know, three or four or five years old. He said, Daddy, 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 fix it, fix it. And he holds it out to me. And yes, I could easily fix it. It just required me take, taking that wheel and just popping it back on. But he was still holding on to it. He was still holding on to it. And I said, Son, if you want me to fix it, give me the truck. Do we hold on to our problems? Do we hold on to our problems or do we give it to the Lord? Do we give it to the Lord? Are we saying, God, Lord, fix this, help me, I need your help, but then we don't give it, you know, we, we don't trust Him to take over. So we hold it to ourselves and, and we won't give it up because, hey, if I give it up, then, hey, I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to be vulnerable. We don't like to be vulnerable. We like to be, we like to be the master of our own ship. We like to be in control. And we don't like to turn control over to God. But Jesus here says, I will answer. We will answer your prayers. Then he says, these things I command you that you love one another. Anytime Jesus keeps on repeating a concept, mark it down, it's important. How many times already... In this speech, chapters 14, chapters 15, and chapter 16, chapter 17 is going to be a prayer that we'll talk about eventually. That's uh, study number 154. How many times has Jesus talked about love? Love, 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 and more love. It's not surprising that John, who is probably the last of our writers in the New Testament, it's not surprising that John himself, he just gushes with love. All you got to do is just look at 1 John, the book of 1 John. It's all about love. Love. Now, we've got five minutes, and I always like to check to see if we've got any questions. Oh, we got questions. Okay, fantastic. Questions, okay. Okay, okay, did not know this. I will mention this. We are experiencing some technical difficulties, uh, so they would not be able to view the slides this evening, so we apologize. Usually our online audience, uh, they do get to see the slides on the screen, uh, but we're having some technical problems, so that happens. You know, technology breaks down, so we are having some technical problems, so uh, we do want to mention that, so we do apologize. Here's a question. 
What do people perceive the Holy Spirit to be today? How do we teach non-Christians about this? That's a fantastic question. Um, I like to doodle. I like to start mapping out things. I like to be organized. And as I said, I am working on either a sermon series or a class series on the Holy Spirit. And that's not my next one. That will be announced Sunday. But in my doodling, that's couple, I've got, right now I've got five questions I've got written down. You actually hit upon two of them. Uh, uh, how do people perceive the Holy Spirit today? Is it just those, you know, you know hit, hit you in the forehead and they fall down, they're healed? You know, that's what some people would say. That's not the Holy Spirit. So how do people perceive the Holy Spirit today? And how do we teach non-Christians about this? I'm going to say, hold on to your horses, because when I get to that either sermon series or class series, that's one of the things we're going to be doing. So um, we're going to be doing that. So uh, I don't want to talk too much about it because that will steal my thunder. Now, uh, we've got about two more minutes here. Let me, uh, let me go ahead and say this. Coming up, Lord willing, on Sunday, Jesus is going to talk about opposition. Expect people to oppose you. And then we're going to ask the question, how are we persecuted today? We're also going to be looking at verses 20 through 25 and talk about how we can bear up to our persecutions and what happens if we try our best to avoid persecutions. Then we're going to talk about how the preaching of the gospel is going to produce even more persecutions. Kind of sounds a little bit like the book of Revelation. And then we're going to be talking in chapter 16 about, well, guess what? More persecutions. Remember Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the teacher for Paul. Uh, he was the guy that spoke up uh, at the Sanhedrin meeting when they had arrested uh, uh, Peter and John and those guys. He added an 18th Sabbath benediction. What they would do is uh, they would go through and they would have their benediction. They had someone stand up and they would go through these different things. And there were 17 of them that they were supposed to mention. The speaker for that day, the guy in charge of the Sabbath meeting. He added a 18th one. His addition was, may Nazarenes, who was referring to as Nazarenes? Christians. He was calling Christians Nazarenes. May Nazarenes and heretics die as in an instant. And that was his prayer. Are you surprised that the Jewish nation took such a strong opposing force to Christianity. That's coming up on, uh, on Sunday. Uh, do read chapter 7 of Revelation. Some, some folks have already read it. That's what we're going to be doing on September the 5th. It's chapter 7. And we're going to be looking at what is the 144,000. And what does that mean? So get ready. That's coming up on September the 5th. Uh, I'm going to let you out a minute early because I'm a nice guy. Appreciate it so much.